Hi, we're talking to Sharon Ron today. Sharon is a speech and language pathologist at the Maytab Center. Hi, Sharon, how are you? Great, how are you? Very well, thank you. Sharon, let's talk a little bit about communication disorders. What is a communication disorder? Communication disorders cover a lot of territory, but we'll break it down into two basic parts, the speech issues and the language issues. Speech disorders can include things like voice disorder. It can include stuttering. It can include intelligibility. It can include um, accent reduction. Those are the speech things. Then there's communication, and that has to, um, then there's language, and that has to do more with understanding, speaking, reading, and writing. So there's a lot of different things that fall under those areas, but communication disorders is when someone has a problem with one or more of those areas. What are some of the causes of communication and speech disorders? Um, in adults, which is who I work with, stroke is, is the biggest cause. I would say that a great deal of our practice is people who have a stroke, and that stroke can be anywhere in the brain, left side, right side, subcortical brainstem, and it can cause different types of speech or language problems. Um, another cause would be dementia, which can cause lots of speech and language problems, um, other kinds of neurological diseases, um, and even theoretically lifestyle things like being a teacher can cause a, a voice disorder or can be more likely to have a voice disorder if you're a teacher. Also things like traumatic brain injury if someone was in a car accident or sports injury or gunshot wound that affected their brain, then they could also have these speech and language issues. What's involved in the speech and language evaluation? Okay, speech and language evaluation, I would say, takes about, in our practice, a good hour and a half, two hours. The first thing is we like to get an incredibly good, detailed, thorough history where we ask the person all kinds of questions about when the problem began, describe the problem, how is it affecting your life. We also read through their medical records. This is very important for us because we want to find out where the area of injury was, which part of the brain was it in. Um, that will give us a big clue as to what kinds of problems to look for. Also, we find that a lot of times people will come in not actually being able to name what the issue is. They may say, my father has trouble speaking when really he has trouble understanding, and that's the cause for his trouble speaking because he, he can't say anything um, that, that makes sense because he can't make sense of anything that's being said to him. Um, so the first part is getting a really, really, really thorough history um, and speaking with the patient and the family members and the caregivers. Uh, after that, based on what we found out, what they are saying their issues are and what the site of injury in the brain is, um, we'll do an evaluation. It can be a standardized evaluation um, like the Boston Diagnostic Aphasia Exam or it can be something more informal. It can be a functional exam um, and that may take a good long time. We also may do um, an oral mechanism exam where we're checking to see how well the different parts of their mouth work and looking for weakness or looking for planning problems. Um, and then at the end of every session, the, the evaluation session will tell the person and their family what we see the problems are and what the treatment is that we re recommend and the frequency of treatment that we recommend. So it takes pretty long time, the first evaluation. Give me an example of what would happen in a, in a treatment. Um, what sort of treatments do you do? Okay. Um, I, to answer that question, I think I'm going to give an example of the types of problems that people may have and then the types of treatments that we may do to help them. Um, if someone has a stroke, for example, on the left side of their brain, uh, which is the dominant side for language, then they may have something called aphasia where they have problems with speaking, understanding, reading, writing to different degrees. There's different types of aphasia. Um, and we would want to rehabilitate the problems that they have, either their difficulty with word retrieval or their difficulty understanding speech. Um, other kinds of problems that we may find in the evaluation would be dysarthria, which would be a muscle weakness of the muscles of the mouth, which may cause them to have a slurred kind of speech. 
Um, there may be something like apraxia, where there's a motor planning problem. It's not a problem in the muscles themselves. It's a problem for the brain to plan what the muscles should do. Um, there also may be other types of problems that we treat, like executive function problems. That would be things like memory, problem solving, sequencing, organization, um, and that can also come from all of these causes that we talked about. Um, and then there's other things that we may look for, stuttering, voice disorders. Very common in our clinic, we see people with nodules or polyps or a paralyzed vocal fold. Um, so the treatment would depend on what the issue would be. But I'll give you an example of treatment or of how we use the evaluation time to try to figure out what's a good treatment. Let's say that I'm trying to see if the person has a word finding problem and I show them a picture of a table. Then I wouldn't just write down if they got the answer wrong, that they got it wrong. I would write down what the wrong answer was. Instead of saying table, did they say babel? Did they say chair? Did they say pinchu? Did they say something related either by the way it sounds or related by what it means or completely unrelated and they made up the word? This gives us a great, great insight into what the nature of the problem is. Then based on the type of pattern that they keep having with their errors, we would say, aha, A, B, and C is intact, but D is not working well. That's what we've got to work on. That's also why the evaluation is such an important time to do a comprehensive thorough eval to find out what exactly is wrong in there. And then and then figuring that out, what exactly is wrong, will lead us towards the right treatment. And just a final question. Um, within the rehabilitation, what role does family and caregivers play? Super important, super important. Um, first of all, whatever, whoever we're treating, we'd like to know what their daily life is like, what the demands of their life are like. Um, thinking about some people that I'm seeing this morning, I have – um, a math professor in university, I have uh, a homemaker with little kids who has nodules, and I have uh, a retired person who had a stroke. Depending on what their demands are will determine what the goals are, and the family and the caregivers can help me figure out what their daily needs are, how far to push them, um, what the ending goal would be. Um, but you totally need the, the help of the family, the patient, the caregivers, to get it on board, meaning it's not like I do an abracadabra trick on the patient and then they're done. There's a lot of participation and cooperation on their part. We give our patients a lot of homework, too, um, so that they can not just have their 45 minutes of therapy, you know, however many times per week, and then go home and not use it, but to take what they've learned in the clinic and then use it at home. So, yeah, we definitely need the family and the caregivers on board with that, too. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you so much. Pleasure.